So um, I have a couple of notes that I prepared. So hello and welcome. I guess most of you know me, but I'm Marcus Herzer, the Guggenheim Gallery Coordinator. About eight months ago, uh, I emailed with Roland Miller, one of the artists in the show, discussing the news of the lockdown. We were in the middle of planning this show and wondering whether to proceed installing in the fall semester, even though campus might still be closed. Roland's answer to the different scenarios we proposed was that yes, absolutely, no matter what shape the exhibition would take, he wanted to go ahead and give it a form and react to whatever would come our way. So here we are, and I'm very excited to host the reception for this exhibition for which we have developed various forms. First, of course, there are the prints of the images, 32 of which are installed in the Guggenheim Gallery. Documentation of the works is available on our website, but we hope that at some point during the semester, you, the audience, will be able to take a look at the photos in person and that we will be able to give tours again. Then there's the Scalar page we've created. Next to our website, guggenheimgallery.net, Scalar has quickly become an incredible, incredibly important way to document and share the exhibitions we create, student exhibitions and curated shows alike. On our Scalar, you will find, as mentioned, the documentation of the installation in the gallery, but also high-res versions of the images, a guided tour of the show with one of the artists, Roland Miller, who's here today, and Professor Justin Walsh, as well as a video inter interview with both artists, Roland Miller and Paolo Nespoli, in conversation with professors Justin Walsh, Leah Halloran, Julie Schaefer, and myself. So that's our show, at which I believe we're gonna take a look later during this reception. Now I'm gonna say a few words about the works and introduce the artists after I admitted this person. There we go. We are absolutely thrilled to premiere this exceptional body of work. The photos provide unique insight into the cultural landscape generated by astronauts, scientists, and visitors on the International Space Station. At the same time, the works constitute a first attempt to co-create photography of this environment by an artist on Earth and an astronaut inhabiting this most remarkable milestone in the development of human capabilities for living in space. With 20 years of ongoing habitation, of which today is the anniversary, the superstructure continues to set the standards in space occupancy from being the largest spacecraft ever constructed, having hosted around 40% of all space travelers to the costliest space endeavor with some estimates as high as $150 billion. The images are witness to the reality of space life, from fixing objects to the wall with Velcro to keep them from floating around the station, to the awe-inspiring view from the station's cupola, its main observation window, onto Earth or into the depths of space. Roland Miller is a Chicago native and studied photography at Utah State University, earning his BFA and MFA degrees. For 14 years, he taught photography at Brevard Community College in Cocoa, Florida, where he was first exposed to many nearby NASA launch sites. He then taught at the College of Lake County in Grace Lake, Illinois, for six years before becoming Dean of its Communication Arts, Humanities, and Fine Arts Division in 2008. Miller retired from higher education in 2018 to work full-time on his aerospace photography. Welcome, Roland. Happy to have you here today. Um, Thank you. Thanks for having us. Paolo Nespoli is not here today. He's the um, other half of the duo. He's an Italian astronaut and engineer of the Euro European Space Agency. In 2007, he first traveled into space aboard the Space Shuttle Discovery as a mission specialist. In December 2010, he again traveled into space aboard the Soyuz TMA-20 spacecraft as an expedition flight engineer. Nespoli's third space flight was on board Soyuz MS-05, which launched in July 2017 for expedition. He received his bachelor's degree in aerospace engineering in 1988 and his master's degree in 1989 in aeronautics and astronautics from Polytech University in New York. We are grateful to the artists Paolo Nespoli and Roland Miller for entrusting us with their extraordinary work and also want to thank professors Leah Halloran and Julie Schaefer for their support of our virtual presentation. Last and in no way least, I also want to thank Justin Walsh. This show has been in the making for about two years now and was largely initiated by Justin. He introduced me to Roland and the three of us were in contact through the various planning stages along the way. Justin Walsh is an American archeologist and an associate professor at Chapman University. He's involved with classical archeology, span but for us tonight most interesting is that he's also a pioneer in the field of space archeology, span 
co-directing the first archaeological investigation of human habitation site in space, the International Space Station Archaeological Project. In space archaeology, Walsh has proposed a new protocol for protecting cultural heritage in space and studied ephemeral space technology from an archaeological perspective. Together with Alice Gorman, he's developing the first archaeological project to study a permanent habitation site in space, the International Space Station. So please welcome Justin Walsh. Thank you, Marcus. I really appreciate that kind introduction. And I just want to uh, note, I, oh, hold on a second. I'm going to mute everybody. OK. So now just this is um, just our general protocol is just to make this run more smoothly. So everybody is currently muted. Um, and if you have questions uh, for um, myself or for Roland or for Marcus, um, you can put them in the chat and Marcus will collect them um, later and um, we can go through at least some of them, you know, obviously depending on time. But uh, to go back to what I was saying, um, it's, it's such a, an amazing opportunity that we have at Chapman University to exhibit this work, which has never been seen anywhere before. Um, and so the way that this, this kind of started, as uh, maybe some of you who are in the, the, the uh, conference a little earlier, I uh, heard Roland say, you know, we, we all connected with one another, myself, uh, my colleague Alice Gorman, um, and Jeffrey Nesbitt, who's also here, those of us who contributed to the book that uh, is also a part of this project called Interior Space, a visual exploration of the International Space Station. Um, we all kind of met organically. Uh, I believe that, that um, uh, Roland, we met on Twitter. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that's how it happened. Um, and so um, we... Uh, connected over our, our interest in uh, space heritage. And I was aware of Roland because of his previous project, which hopefully you can see, um, the book Abandoned in Place, uh, which uh, uh, covers the uh, space heritage of the United States, the United States, excuse me, in Florida and elsewhere. Um, these are really remarkable art photographs. And I, I suggest you check out uh, Roland's website at abandonedinplace.com. Uh, Com, I believe that's right, um, and Roland can correct me. Um, the fact is we were originally hoping not only to install this, this art uh, at Chapman for this particular week, because it is today the 20th anniversary of continuous habitation of the International Space Station. Um, we wanted to mark that with this event. We were actually intending to have um, uh, Paolo as well as Roland uh, present and unfortunately, obviously, because of the pandemic, we weren't able to do that. Um, the Scalar website, which Marcus has created, and it looks fabulous. I highly suggest you check it out, and he'll put a link into uh, the chat for everybody. Um, that website uh, shows you our efforts to recreate that experience as best as we can. So you will actually see the works installed on the walls. Uh, there's also a video walkthrough that I did with uh, Roland when he was in California about a month ago, um, and uh, a video conference that a group of us did with Roland and with Paolo. All of those are on the website at the moment. So I, I encourage you to check those out. We're doing the best that we can, obviously, in this situation. I also just want to draw everybody's attention to a fantastic story about this body of work that was published online today in the New York Times. and. Um, and also, uh, it will be coming out in print tomorrow. I've just put it into the chat so you can check it out. A really fabulous story about this, this body of work that uh, both Roland and, and Paolo talk about what they were doing. We'll hear more about that a little bit uh, later. I think part of what I'm supposed to do here is talk about what uh, the relationship is between an archaeologist like me and my colleague Alice um, and photography on the International Space Station um, and how that connected us to uh, to Roland. And essentially what we're doing in the International Space Station Archaeological Project is we're trying to study this site to understand it, and this is a phrase that somebody else came up with in the 1970s, as a micro-society in a mini-world. 
that is to say that any spacecraft, when you have any group of people together, especially you know, in an enclosed area like a spacecraft, they're going to create their own society and they're going to structure their society through a unique culture that they create. And one of the windows that we can have onto that society is by looking at what archaeologists refer to as material culture. That is to say, the objects that people use and the built spaces that they occupy. Uh, when we're excavating in the ground, we do the same thing. What objects are we finding where in relation to what else in the same context? And that's how we build our stories about the past. Obviously, it's a little unusual for us to be looking at a site that not only exists in our present day, but is in fact still occupied. Uh, but the, the very recent past is still the past. And so we can look at those last 20 years of habitation and try to understand aspects of the socio-cultural lives of the crew of the space station. And we're doing this, and I'm just going to show you a couple of quick examples here. I don't want to take up too much time, um, but I'm going to show you briefly um, a, uh, just a couple of slides. Um, and I'm actually going to, this is the last one, I'm going to scroll up. Just to show you, these are some of the images um, that we see of life on the space station, right? These are images that the astronauts themselves took. Um, so we see them doing experiments, eating food. Uh, here's another food. But you, you notice that there are aspects of their world, uh, such as a little bottle here for condiments, probably salsa or, or hot sauce or something like that, signage that's actually humorous, speed limit 28,000 kilometers an hour, because that's how fast the space station is traveling, um, the different kinds of food that they're eating. We're actually looking at a European astronaut, Samantha Cristoforetti, who's eating food that was provided by the European Space Agency, as opposed to the crew from other agencies that eat different food that's provided by their agencies. Um, the work that they're doing with taking photographs of the Earth um, or the meals that they share together. Talk about something that's uh, uh, an activity that we all share, right? We all are, are having meals with other people, um, you know, and interacting with them and, and behaving according to a certain set of etiquette, et cetera. That's what we're studying. Again, you see the condiments on the wall. The stuff, the food that they're given doesn't necessarily taste as much um, in space as it does on the Earth. So they always have to add flavoring. Um, so our question as archaeologists is how do we get from uh, the life on spa in space on the space station? So here we see an astronaut, or in this case a cosmonaut, exercising on a treadmill. How do we get from that to archaeological observation and, and analysis? And we're actually using the photographs for that, to look, for example, at the wall behind this cosmonaut and to notice that there are actually religious items, orthodox icons and a cross and images of Soviet space heroes like Yuri Gagarin there in the background. Um, that those are objects that have meaning within that space and we're looking at that. Now I wanna just connect that to what we see in the images that Paolo took in conjunction with Roland um, here is an image of the U.S. module node one, which is part of the show. And in addition to all the stickers representing missions that have already happened, right, that are placed there by each crew as they finish, we can see that there's a, a box here that says Paolo's and breakfast. So this is the meals, that <laughs> the meal packs that they have, and they're, you know, they each have their own. Beyond that, up above, you know, along with the duct tape here in the, in the upper left, on this hatch door, you can actually see a makeshift memorial. This is improvised, uh, a way of re remembering other astronauts who have passed away by placing their images or other items associated with them, including what appears to be an office door nameplate of at least one crew member, um, a, a memento of a friend who was lost. Uh, that's really interesting. So this is in the U.S. module, or for example, another image taken by Paolo uh, on the inside of the hatch of the Columbus, the European module, where we not only have stickers of European missions, but we have a UNICEF sticker that was placed there because of a partnership between the European Space Agency and UNICEF, or at least one of the crew and UNICEF, and even an artwork by the street artist Invader, the French street artist Invader, that was actually placed there uh, in partnership with the European Space Agency. And if you're into geocaching, here's a geocaching tag. So whoever wants to be the first to claim that, if you're into that, good luck to you. Um, but you see the kinds of things that people put up 
on the, the, these, these spaces that are not designed for images. And they're making this really their home and I think that that's one of the wonderful things about the images that Paolo took. And in fact, he's spoken about that both in the video conference we did and in the New York Times article today about how he was really taking care to try and record the human presence in the space station. And that's one of the things that I think uh, I, I, I would argue that Roland and Paolo are really getting across through this body of work. Uh, okay, so I'm going to stop there. I think I've said plenty. Um, again, if you have any questions about that, I'm happy to answer them, but I'm going to turn this over now to Roland if you want to talk about uh, how this whole um, idea for the show came about and, um, uh, and your collaboration with, uh, with Paolo. Um, yeah, I, so I, I'd love to tell you that I woke up one morning, I had this brilliant idea to photograph the space station in conjunction with a national on board, but that's not what happened. I had uh, some of the work that Justin showed you, the book, The Abandoned Place Work. I had uh, probably about 30 photographs of that on display in the astronaut crew quarters at the Kennedy Space Center. And, and in 1999, I got a call at work at the college I was teaching at there in Cocoa, Florida, from Katie Coleman, an American astronaut, and she left a message because I was at a conference. And, she said, you know, I, I really like your photographs. My husband is a glass artist. Her husband is a gentleman named Josh Simpson, a very good glass artist. And she said, you know, the, I think these are really amazing and uh, just wanted to let you know what I thought of them. And the, the arts are very important to me and my husband, so thank you. So when I got back, I called out there and she was already gone and I never did connect with her. Fast forward to 2014, so 15 years later, I went out to... Uh, a launch at the Space Center, it was uh, EFT-1, it was the test launch of the first Orion capsule on a Delta IV heavy rocket. And uh, they brought four astronauts in to work with the press, Katie was one of them. And so after the launch, I went up and introduced myself and she said, oh, I remember your work. And she said, boy, it'd be great, you know, if, if there was a way we could kind of connect your, your method and your vision for photography with the astronauts on the International Space Station. And she, said, think about how you could do that. So I thought, okay, well, somebody like that tells me to do that, I'm gonna do it. You know, never imagining it would really mount it. I put together a proposal, sent it to her. She liked it. She said, I like, you know, this, this is good. But she said, the only way we're gonna get this to work is if we connect you with an astronaut. And she said, I actually have the perfect person, and it was Paolo, and he was going up in about nine months from that point. And so she put us together, um, and my proposal had been to do this in real time where you would tether a digital camera to a laptop and cast the image back to Earth and the astronaut would move through the station and then I'd tell them exactly what to take a picture of. First time I talked to Paolo, and I'm assuming he's not with us because it's like two in the morning there in Italy. Um, he, he was very polite, like as politely as he could, he goes, Oh yeah, we could do all that technically. I think that's really, you know, possibly simple. You know, there's pretty much no way you're going to get what they refer to as astronaut time, official time to do this. Uh, you know, my heart sank. He said, but I, I think it's a good idea and I'd be willing to use some of my personal time to do it. So ironically, like if, if we had done it my way, number one, I would have been, I was hoping to get an hour, maybe two hours of time, um, which I've come to find out when they people do commercial projects, it's about seventeen thousand five hundred dollars an hour. I think they just do it like every mile per hour. You get charged a dollar because that's how fast the station goes. But anyway, and on top of that, this ended up because he did this on his own time, and we weren't doing it in real time. He actually spent quite a bit more time than two hours. I don't know. I need to look at the timestamps on all the photos, but I'm sure he spent probably. 20 hours working on this, which is an immense amount of time and probably more than that. I don't, I don't really even know. So, um, and that's how it came about. And when I put the proposal together, you know, I didn't want to do what had already been done. Um, I would have loved to have done photography out the windows, out the cupola, just of the earth, because it's beautiful there. You know, they're so abstract to begin with. And I like, abstraction in my images, but I thought that, that I'm, you know, I'm probably not going to be able to do better than what's being done now. And 
I want to do something that's going to be worthwhile for, for Paolo and his time. And also NASA had to approve this, even though it wasn't going to be done on their time, they still had to okay it. So I wanted it to be something that at least I hope they would think was valuable. So I thought looking at the rest of my work, which is documenting space facilities and space vehicles, I thought, what if I just concentrated on the interior of the station? It would have been great to do the outside, but that was really crazy because the you know the, when they're outside the station, every second counts, and there, I knew there was no way that that would work. Um, so we were able, thanks to Paolo and one of his colleagues, a gentleman named Claudio Salazzo, who was his mission manager from the Italian Space Agency, who ran interference for us and got all this stuff approved in record time. Because really, to get this approved in like eight months was miraculous, um, and. Uh, and it, Paolo's idea, you know, was that we would just email the images back and forth. And so I had planned to photograph the mock-up of the ISS. There's actually two. There's one that's laid out pretty much like the ISS. is. It's very low fidelity. It's used for emergency egress training and stuff. And the, there's another one that actually has the equipment, the, the racks. And, and so they, they learn how to do the experiments there. I photographed the the low fidelity one that's laid out like the station to get a feel for the lighting and the spacing and what lenses I'd use. And while I was there, they said, oh, you know, uh, we're releasing with Google a, a, a street view, a Google street view of the interior of the station on Thursday. And it was Tuesday. And they actually let me get access to it on Wednesday. And once I got in, I thought, oh, this would be great. And then I realized, oh, not only can he use this to see what the station looks like, like because this was July and they just photographed it in April and March, I believe. And, they, and the station's always in flux. They're moving where they store things. They're even moving racks of equipment around. But it was going to be fairly similar. But I also realized that I could do screen captures off the of Google Street View and send those to Paolo and have him recreate with modifications, with some instructions, what... Um, what was in those images. So it really simplified and allowed me to fine tune that you can't get every perspective, you can't stop at every spot. So we had to do some adjusting. And then on top of that, it was a collaboration. So I, I wanted Paolo to use his knowledge and experience of both spaceflight and the ISS to insert himself into the pictures as well, not, not, not literally in like his hand, but, and so, and I think he did a really good job and then he'd send them to me if, I wanted to make changes, we, he'd go back, but we really didn't do a lot of reshooting. It was a pretty clean uh, and efficient process to do it. And we, we believe that it's the first time a visual artist on Earth and an astronaut have collaborated at least to this level, this amount of work and this level of detail in the work. So, um, and you know, hopefully uh, it's the beginning of something. Right now, space travel is not, uh, really available to those of us in the humanities and the social science, as Justin will easily agree. <laughs> and uh, it, uh, but it, you know, it, it is an important part of being human. I mean, I think the whole purpose of going into space is at, at its base, at its most basic level, is to answer two questions: Where did we come from, and why are we here? And and those questions need to be addressed, at least in part, by people in the humanities and people in the social sciences. So eventually, there will, there will come a day when uh, artists and writers and poets and theologians and philosophers and even archaeologists, Justin, will be allowed to go into space and do their work. And it'll, you know, I, you know, right now the world doesn't uh, quite uh, accommodate that, but I'm sure it will at some point. Uh, it's worth, and, uh, it's, worth, it's worth noting that Paolo in the video conference said that he thought that that should happen. Oh, yeah. Well, he, he you know, I keep saying that, and he kind of planted that. He didn't plant that thought in my mind, but he expressed it in our very first conversation. When I first talked to him, which is when I knew he would be the perfect partner of this, because he said, they said, you know, we should be sending writers and poets and painters into space. He said, but right now it's just not economically feasible. And he, and he spoke to the Pope from the station. He actually spoke to two Popes. He spoke on his first trip on the 
uh, his most recent trip in 2017, and he basically told the Pope that same thing that you know eventually we need to get to that point because I always tell I, I would have a and there's some of my students watching possibly I know I've seen a few of you pop up um, but I would always tell my photo history class that it was photo history was the most important class they would take in their college education and they'd all look at me like I was nuts because you know of a class of 30 people. 28 of them were there because they needed the gen ed humanity credit. Two of them were there because they really loved photography. And I'd say that, I'd say, and I'd give, go through this whole thing about how, you know, why do you go to college to get a degree? Why do you get a degree to get a better job? Why do you want a better job to make more money? Why do you want more money to be able to afford to live and do better things? What do you do with all that money? You pay the rent, you pay your car, you know, you pay your utilities. What do you have? At the end, you got a little bit of money left over. What do you do with that? Oh, we go to concerts. We go to, museums, you know, we go to baseball games and football games. And I'd say, all right, this class is going to help you appreciate all, all the things you do with that disposable income more than any other class, because you're going to, you've, you've spent your whole life learning and working to make that little bit of money to go have a little bit of fun, which right now none of us can do, which is, I think, one of the problems with all this, or we're also batty, but we got to keep doing it. But anyway, um, a course like that will help you appreciate and get more out of it and get more out of that experience that you literally have worked your whole life for. So they would all look at me probably like some of you are looking at me now, like, what are you talking about? But, but that, this concept that the humanities and, you know, and I'm not saying we're better than the other sciences, but we're just as important. And especially, I think, when it comes to answering those kind of questions. So Here, here, Roland. And I, I would just... I would just say, I think that us put, like, especially you and Marcus, actually putting on the show in the middle of all of this, actually installing the works, and they're there well, in the gallery, and hopefully people will at some point be able to go in there and see them, um, you know, but just that, that is an act of uh, uh, kind of standing up to the current well, situation and saying, we're still going to go ahead and do this because it's important. You know, it's it's a it's a little bit of faith in the fact that I'm fairly confident I'll be able to show the work in other venues at some point. But it's also a really beautiful museum and a great setting. And um, I get to tell people I had a show at the Guggenheim. I don't have to be more specific. No, there's no law that says that I don't have to tell them it's the Guggenheim at Chapman University. Nothing wrong with that. It's a wonderful gallery. But it's up to them to decide which Guggenheim. <laughs> no, but I just you know it, it's a um, uh, a lot, you know, museums are in a quandary right now. So many things are, and um, I just got a video from. I have a piece in a, a show at the Museum of Contemporary Photography, uh, and what's it called? Oh, I can't think of the name. It's about democracy. It's really, it's actually, and they did a really high quality video for the they They got seven of their faculty who were to curate it, and and. Uh, and again, you can make appointments to get in there, but I, I, don't, I bet right now you can't even do that. So, you know, there's ways to, to do this. And um, I think we did the walkthrough. We, I really enjoyed the panel discussion. If you guys have time, uh, I, I think you'd enjoy watching that. Paolo's in it and several other faculty members from Chapman. It's, I thought it was a very good discussion. And my dog is in the walkthrough. He is. <clears throat> And he wouldn't leave your side. He was like Velcro dog to you. Marcus, do you want to? Yeah, absolutely. So while we're not able to see the show uh, in the space, we have this virtual space. I'm going to share my screen. Please. And we've put together the Scala exhibition of the show <clears throat> um, with the text by Justin as a kind of uh, introduction that's also in the book of the same name. Um, and I put a link to the book uh, in the chat. chat. Yeah. And then we have the videos we mentioned. There's the walkthrough with Roland and with Justin and also a conversation with Paolo and Roland and Justin and Leah Halloran and Julie Schaefer and myself. Uh, this video is 90 minutes. <laughs> this video is a half hour. 
So if you feel one day radio doesn't really do it today for me, just put on these. There's much more information about all the different aspects of the project that we couldn't really touch upon today in the 20 minutes or 25 minutes that we had. Um, and um, yeah, so this video talks about the show itself, the installation, uh, and Roland talks about uh, his process, and Justin also points out uh, a few details about life on the space station. This here is a conversation with Paolo, uh, and we hear firsthand from Paolo what it's really like in the space station and how uh, shooting those works uh, actually worked and many more things. Uh, and so we had an array of different interviewers to cover all aspects of uh, this Q&A uh, from, from uh, photo technical aspects to uh, archeological to just plain artistic aspects. So, um, and then of course, last but not least, where's the link? That's interesting, that's why Justin, you didn't find it earlier. The link is not on the page. So um, there is also doc extensive documentation of the show. This is what it looks like. This is happening at Chapman University right now as we speak. And Look at how great that show looks. It's Look really amazing. We're yeah. very, we were very <laughs> proud and happy <laughs> with how it all turned out and came together. Is my, is my mic still on? Can you guys hear me? Yes. So, uh, you know, I want to applaud Marcus because I had sent him a kind of a rough layout just to get things going. And we spent uh, at least half a day kind of laying out the show, moving things around. And, and he did a great job of uh, pulling the work together in groups that it was, it was interesting for me because they, uh, I was trying to do this in a very, in my typical, what's typical for me, hybrid documentary abstract approach and this was very different than I've done a project like that on the abandoned pads and another one on the space shuttle and this was very different because it was hard to abstract things on the surface at least and after we got the show laid out I, I could see the abstraction more than I could and you know when you work on this stuff I've been working on these images because they required a lot of post-production work because of the lighting and other things so I've been working on these for two years, um, not every day, but very close. I know it may seem weird, but it took a lot of work. And uh, I really could see that the abstraction kind of come through, what I would call abstraction. I actually got to a point in the, sp in the space shuttle project where I what was abstract and what was documentary actually reversed on me because I could look at a part of the satellite photographs and I could tell exactly what things were. And when I did an overall more documentary shot, there was so much there. There, were, there was so much going on. It, it, it was, it would, it became abstract. I, I know it's a very odd thing to say, but my mind kind of went through this uh, polar reversal. There are shots in the show um, by Paolo, like the two, you just scroll back. Can you scroll back? Yeah, yeah. like those two. I, I wanted to include in the book some photographs Paolo made because they're just spectacular. He photographed the space station uh, when he was departing on Excavation 27, which was before we were connected together. Um, our, our work was on Expedition 52 and 53. And, he, um, but this was the Endeavour, Space Shuttle Endeavour was docked at the ISS, was STS-134. And they were supposed to leave on their Soyuz capsule, which he'd flown up on and go back to Earth. He'd been up there for about five months. And normally they wait to leave in the Soyuz until the shuttles depart because they don't want to bang into them, damage the tiles, spray uh, reactant, propellant, or something on them. But they also realized this was going to be the last time that a Soyuz could depart while there was a shuttle docked at the station. So they had they had them leave with the shuttle docked and it's this whole the Paolo's got a great long story about it where they're actually the, the Soyuz is like three pods and you're in the middle one that you return to earth in but there's only windows in the in the in the end one away from the engine so he had to you know get you know permission they wanted him to do it to you know 
get out of his seat, get out of partly out of his spacesuit, open a hatch that had already been sealed for this, climb into the other one, take pictures, and then come back in and get it all bundled back up in for landing. So he spent about 20 minutes photographing the space station with the shuttle docked at it. And Mission Control actually rotated the station, I think 360 degrees, so he could get shots at different angles. And they're just stunning images of the station. And, I, I, you know, we did we thought about putting a, like an exploded view of the station in, but even when you look at those, it's really hard to get a concept of what it is. So I opted for the, the amazing pictures over the exploded view. And then that, there are a lot of pictures in the book that I took of Earth-based facilities, uh, both of the mock-ups at Johnson Space Center of the space station, uh, a, a, a research mock-up that's at Marshall where they do uh, life support system, uh, environment control life support system uh, experiments to, to solve problems, to modify the systems, improve them. And uh, uh, so that you'll, and then also the, the space station uh, processing facility where the modules would come before they were launched. So I, I had done some of that work long before I got connected with Paolo back in the late 90s. Uh, but uh, yeah, that's what you're seeing there. Some of those. So it, to kind of fill in the story that it's not, you know, there's a lot behind the scenes going on um, to get to the point where they actually have the station on orbit. So yeah, we have photography of the exhibition, but then we also have all of the individual photos because you can obviously get close yeah. enough in the exhibition photography uh, on this page. So you could take a closer look and investigate for yourself and look at these really amazing, I mean, stunning photos. If anybody has questions and wants to put them in the chat, this is a good time to do that. Um, and while that's happening, I mean, Roland, uh, one thing that I think would be interesting for people is you were talking about the post-processing. And on the one hand, you know, there's, there's the fact that you were using images from cameras that weren't your own. But can you just talk a little bit about the, uh, the loss of pixels? Because I think that's a phenomenon yeah. that people yeah. are, are going to be interested in. Well, and this, so CCDs and CMOS chips, the, the, the chips that replace film in a film camera, you know, in the, in the digital camera that replaced what would be the film, the light receptive um, parts of the camera, they are very susceptible to radiation. So even if you fly a lot, you know, with a, a DSLR camera over time, the cosmic radiation, even just being up at 30,000 feet, there's more radiation and it can over time damage those pixels. Them being out in outer space with no atmosphere to protect things at all, the, sen the sensors really get damaged. So like in the first batch of photographs I got from Paolo, there were all these bad pixels and they'll be like red and blue and, you know, white and green that depending on how it damaged the photo sites that actually create the pixel. So, um, and I had to go in and fix those. And there were some, uh, a good number of the cameras initially they eventually got new cameras and it got better. But um, I would kind of look through the pictures and look at the serial numbers of the cameras and say to Paolo, all right, avoid these cameras because they're really bad, they've got a lot. And I could fix it, but there are, there are times when it, you know, it got, is that a spot on the wall or is that a bad pixel? And I had just had to, you know, use my best guess. It's nothing anyone, they're so small, no one would ever notice, but, um, yeah, so that was a, uh, an issue. The other issue that you run into when photographing on the space station is, and this was uh, amplified by the process I wanted to use, uh, most of the photographs that are taken, like the ones you saw Justin show of the astronauts eating and things, far and away the majority of those are taken with an on-camera flash. Because you're in a weightless environment, you need to stop everyone's motion. But what that does is, you know, the light from a flash is brightest near the camera and it falls off. It's the inverse square law of light, light um, 
dissipates inversely square to the distance. So uh, without getting too scientific, if you have a light that's uh, one foot away and a light that's two feet away, one foot away, it's, it's actually four times as bright as the light two feet away, not, not twice as bright. Anyway, more than you need to know about the inverse square law of light. But I didn't want that effect of, of, of the modules darkening as you got farther and farther back. I wanted it. I wanted to show it like it might feel if you were floating there in the station and you looked down the length of the station or you looked across a couple modules. And to do that, we had to shoot uh, without a flash. And we couldn't use a tripod either because the tripod wouldn't do any good. It's weightless. I expected Paolo to shoot at a high film speed, a high ISO, <clears throat> effectively the film speed in this case. And um, Paolo being an engineer, uh, actually figured out how to put two of the articulated arms together. So if you look down, like if you stay on this picture for a second, there's a laptop over on the right and it's on an articulated arm and, and they have those arms all over the station. They mount cameras on them, the laptops and all kinds of things but they're on one arm because it's weightless. But the station is moving so fast and there's so much equipment and whatnot that it actually has like a harmonic vibration to it. So you can't put a camera on one arm and have it hold still, it'll just shake. So he figured out a way, again, being an engineer to hook two of those armatures onto one camera. But then he had to clamp those to these blue rails they have everywhere. And that meant he had to find open rails so he had to oftentimes move rails all over the place. It was really a, I, I, it was about as challenging as I could have made it for him. He was very great. He never complained about, about it. I think it was interesting, but, um, so he was able to work and he was able to shoot uh, a good portion of the work that way and shoot all the way down at 100 ISO. Although the last group of photographs he shot, he just wanted to get a whole bunch. So he cranked up the ISO to about a thousand. And, handheld shots and they were a little blurrier and a little um, <clears throat> so I had to do a fair amount of work. My goal was to make all the prints look equally sharp. So again that's partly why it took me so long to get them all processed. That's that's totally right. no uh, sorry Justin. No 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 worries. I was just gonna comment and I know there's a question there which yeah. is for you Marcus. Uh, but I just wanted to comment about the the radiation the the radiation hitting the sensors and blowing out pixels is actually, it's really interesting as an analog for the experience of the astronauts themselves who are equally being bombarded by the same radiation. And they talk about how when they're in their crew berths going to sleep, they, their eyes are closed and they see flashes from time to time. And that those are actually the radiation particles hitting their retinas yeah. as flying through space. So it's, what, it's a similar kind of damage that they're suffering as they're going through. This is a remarkable experience. Anyway, I'll leave that. And Marcus, if you want to deal with the, the question. Yeah, Roland, a question for you. Was there any post-processing done with Paolo's photos while in the Soyuz leaving the ISS? Um, yeah, I did. I did, uh, I, I did so, um, yes. <laughs> so they were, you know, if you, uh, when I got them, they were very kind of, off color, I, to be honest, I thought. And um, I have a process that I quote unquote invented that I loving referred to, lovingly referred to as the tone system, as a partly as a nod to Ansel Adams and his own system, the famous black and white photographer who made the luscious black and white prints. The tone system is a, is a six step process of color correcting and adjusting white point, black point, density, contrast, and um, vibrance or saturation for an image. And so I ran them all through that process to neutralize the color and um, also brighten up the color because they seemed a, a bit dull. So yeah, I did. I, um, uh, and I took out a lot, of bad, a lot of bad pixels in that sky too. Do we have any other questions from the audience? Bueller, Bueller. While we're waiting for that, I just also want to acknowledge the um, the support that we've had for this, um, particularly from the president of Chapman University, Daniele Strupa, 
who was kind enough to support the accommodations of Roland when he traveled uh, to California from Utah to install the show. Um, we, we actually had a whole variety of people signed on to support the, the visit of both Roland and Paolo if we had been able to do the whole thing. Um, and unfortunately, uh, that's not, uh, that, that isn't happening, maybe in the future sometime. I, I see we have a question from Alice. Marcus, do you want to? Uh, yeah, Alice is asking, Roland, what is your favorite image? What's your favorite question? Yeah. Um, like I said, someone asked that in the uh, uh, panel discussion. And that I was said, me. <laughs> that was you. Was it you? It's, it's um, as I said, it's a little like picking your favorite child. But, but it's, it's actually, as far as a single image, it's the image of the cupola, which I don't know if you can scroll to that or not. Um, so even though we said we weren't using flash, there was one scenario where we did need to use flash, and that was when the earth was visible outside, which was only occasioned when photographing the cupola. We wanted to balance the inside of the cupola with the lighting on the earth outside. So Paolo did use a flash for that and you know I I would love to tell you that I spent much months studying the weather patterns and the ocean currents and the formation of cumulus clouds over the Pacific um, and, and determine the exact date and time when the, this type of pattern would most likely be there but in reality we just got really lucky there's this beautiful set of clouds visible and uh, I asked Paul when he got back, oh, did you wait, have to wait long to get those calls? He's like, I didn't wait at all. He said, you know, the cupola is really busy. People are doing stuff in there all the time. So you got to go in, do your work, and then get out. So we just got very lucky on this. But I like the, the, the dichotomy between the very geometric, mechanical, architectural interior of the cupola with the very biomorphic forms out, you know, of the clouds and the ocean patterns down below. And then that central window, to me, is all, almost like a metaphor for the Earth itself, if you were to view it from space, if there were, if there were no landforms visible, at least. So I, I think that's the, the image that, when I saw it, I thought, oh, that's, you know, if, if we had done nothing else, if we got nothing else out of this project and we got that image, it would have been worth it. Okay, I think that may be all the questions. It looks like it. So, so perhaps we should close the reception? Yeah. I, mean, I, 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 I propose a toast. We'll end on this one. To Roland and Paolo and Marcus for uh, the extraordinary. And to, and to you and Jeff and Alice who have joined us who are uh, a big part of this as well, and uh, Jeff. Oh, and there's Don Clark. Look at the Don Clark one. <laughs> so, cheers to you, and congratulations cheers. on this exceptional body of work. And uh, also, hey, 20 years of ISS today. Pretty yes. awesome. That's, cheers that's to what that. We're posting. Continuous habitation of space. I was thinking today there are, um, you know, there are kids in college who weren't alive when all of us lived on the earth. You know, so that's a pretty amazing thing. So. I think that was the most amazing f formulation that the last time all humans were on the earth. Yeah. Was 20 <laughs> years ago today, or to actually 20 years ago, two days ago. Oh, when they yeah, yeah. yeah. A great way of putting it. Yeah. Well, thank you all for coming out. I really appreciate it. Yeah, if you, uh if you get if you get out to Chapman, don't go see the, the exhibit because you can't get in. <laughs> <laughs> I was I sent the announcement out. I thought I hope no one shows up there at the gallery. Because of this. <laughs> but I figured they'd read the banner on the. Uh, I think they read the banner on your website before one. So. Well, we're close until further notice. Maybe hopefully later this semester we will be able to actually. Have people in the gallery, it'd be amazing.
Yeah, hopefully, yeah. yeah. The work does look different in person. It's different yeah. when you experience the actual prints. Well, thank you all for joining us. I really appreciate it. Thank you, yeah. Roland. Good to thank meet someone who I haven't met before, too. Yeah. Thanks for being here, Roland and Justin and everybody else. Thank you so much. And also, Justin and Roland, thanks for involving me in this project. It's really amazing. Oh, you're, thank you for all your hard work, you and Justin, both specifically. Thank you. Okay. All right. All righty. Uh, ciao. I'll give that for Paolo. Have a good evening, everyone. Arrivederci. Arrivederci.